morning, Anselm Bible family, and good morning, Facebook friends. Welcome to Sunday morning worship uh, here at the Anselm Bible Fellowship. We thank you for joining us this morning. What a glorious, glorious morning it is. Let's go to our Father in prayer so that he can feed us from his word. Father in heaven, we thank you again this morning. Father, we have so much to be thankful for, not just, <clears throat> not just because your time, or you've given us time, an extended period of time down here in your creation, Father, that we can actually redeem, Father, and make useful and valuable by studying your blessed word, for by it we live, by it we are sustained down here, Father. We ask that you feed us this morning and you feed us well. Uh, we thank you uh, for, for, for all of those who are able to assemble. We thank you for putting us in our right mind this morning, Father, and we know and we trust and we pray that you will be a God in the midst. Amen. Coming from 2 Timothy, and we find ourselves ourselves in a new series this morning, and it's entitled Elected to Endure. Elected to Endure. Coming from the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the chapter is 2, the verses 3 through 13, 3 through 13. Needless to say, we won't get through all of that this morning. As a matter of fact, we'll just be taking care of the introduction. The introduction this morning, uh, we hope to get into a little bit more of the meat, but we'll see what time allows. Second Timothy, second chapter, verses three through 13. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first, must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David also, excuse me, who was raised from the dead according to the gospel, for which I suffer as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. This is a fruitful saying, for if we died with him, we shall live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I said, we'll be just dealing with the introduction, a little bit of the background to the text. Of course, we're coming from the book of 2 Timothy, Paul's second letter, to his understudy, Timothy. Now, Paul was writing to Timothy, his son in the faith, during this second imprisonment, Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, in this Roman jail. It's about 67 AD, Anno Domini. We know it as after death, after the death of Christ commonly. So 67 or so years, give or take, after the death of Christ. Paul was likely arrested by the Roman Emperor Nero, and we uh, during his persecution of the Christians that we've previously documented and documented in detail. We remember Nero, about 64 AD or so, when he began to arrest and persecute the Christians for the burning of Rome. 
There's a distinct difference, however, in Paul's tone between the first letter to Timothy, his understudy, understudy meaning Timothy's a younger pastor, first letter to Timothy and the second letter to Timothy because we're in 2 Timothy, as it pertains to the tone and particularly with respect to Paul's expectations regarding his possibility of being released from prison. In the first epistle, written about 62 to 64 AD, and this first epistle, or 1 Timothy, was written to Timothy right after his the release from his first imprisonment in the Roman jail. His first incarceration in the Roman jail, uh, Paul wrote several letters, and we can get some information from several of the books that he wrote. So during his first imprisonment and immediately after, he also wrote to the Philippians. Turn to the book of Philippians. I want you folks to keep in mind as well as we continue on, as we kind of plod through all of the, uh, everything that goes with the current state of affairs, if you would. I think my daughter asked me just yesterday, Dad, are these the strangest years of your life? <laughs> and it's a good question because it's kind of like, yeah, in many ways, Sophia, yes, they are. I mean, you guys, my, my children, they're going through many things as younger people, 50 years old, 51 years old. And it is everything, so many things, should I say, are so different and so uncommon and have never been seen before as a result of COVID, COVID and everything that goes with it. Strange times, strange times. What is the Christian required to do during strange times, during these times that are so curious and uncommon, during these times where things that have never been seen before are now your common and daily standard? And we're hoping that they're temporary. They say the numbers are going down. As a Christian, what are we required to do? Well, I would offer any number of things, one of which indeed is to endure. It's to endure. What's your frame of reference for that word, endurance? Right? There's a treadmill in this house. Just, just off camera here. Um... <laughs> I look there and I'm thinking, yeah, endure. There's a basketball court outside. I take the children to training. Sheree and I try to set up a, 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 a workout schedule. And when we get out there, when we get out there, yeah. uh, when we get out there, and I said that three times, that's kind of, I feel, I, feel, yeah. <laughs> I feel like a rooster should crow. Mm -hmm. um, when we get out there, we, we, we map out how far we we're going to go. And it's not going to be a dead sprint. Otherwise, we ain't going to last too long, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The thing is about the scripture, we're supposed to run as if we are in a race and as, as if we are stretching and as, as if we are reaching and all of our muscles flexing towards the prize, the goal, the end of the race. And we're supposed to live that way with respect to the gospel, with that kind of intensity throughout the race. Endurance. We'll talk, of course, about what election is. Oh my goodness, what a doctrine. Doctrine that inspires so many emotions mm -hmm. on uh, fr from those who are saved and not saved. We are elected indeed. Certainly applies today to endure. I ask you to go to the book of Philippians, the chapters 1, verses 19. The verse 19, and we'll also read verse 25 and 26. We were noting that, again, there's a distinct difference in Paul's first incarceration in Rome and his second incarceration in Rome. While there in the jail, first incarceration, to the book of Philippians. 
119. He says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Time for time six, skip down to verse 25. And Paul says, being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. We know those verses, right? Those are the verses where Paul is saying, well, I can, I can, I can stay or I can go. I can go home with my father in heaven. And Paul had been through so much. And I always pause there. It's like, what in the world, Paul, can you imagine his life? his seriousness of faith, his, his living such a life, his being so instrumental in writing and doc <coughs> documenting and establishing churches, and the gospel, of course, that would, uh, 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 that, would, that would completely change the world. Paul says, I can go home right now. Death for us today, of course, because we have so much, so many creature comforts and we live in the flesh. It's a lot different. The last thing we want to do is think about dying. Paul says, that's the first thing I want to do. I've done so much and I've seen so much and I've, I'm sure Paul had been thinking, well, I've, I've been almost dead any, any number of times anyway. So close. Paul says, but yes, to die is gain, but it's better to, for your sakes. In other words, for sake of the gospel, for sake of ministry, for sake of furthering the kingdom of Christ, that I stay here and continue to work. What does Paul say? He's saying, I've got to endure. I've got to continue. There's labor to be done. Verse 25 says, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress. And joy of faith, verse, faith, verse 26, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul says, I'm going to be back with you. I'm in prison now, but I'll be getting out soon. Paul is saying, I'm in prison now, but I'm confident. I'm in prison now, but this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, though Paul's life was marked by numerous persecutions, he sounds surprisingly sure of his release. First incarceration in Rome. During his initial incarceration, Paul was also under what you might call house arrest. He was in a house. He was allowed numerous vis visitors and ministry was allowed to continue as freely as an incarceration could allow you. Paul was allowed still to do ministry. He was allowed to do what he needed to do. He was allowed many visitors. Now, we're in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, a few years later. A few years later, Paul's tone's a little bit different. As if he's aware that the end is near. 2 Timothy, go to chapter 4. The verses 6. And we'll read through 8. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For I am already being poured out, you know the verse, as a drink offering. The time of my, and the time of my departure is at and I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Speaking of his reward, he's thinking that his race is over. Paul feels differently this time around. The crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and he says not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing same man 
just a few years difference. This is right around 67 AD. Just four or five years later, three, four years later. And Paul's tone is completely different. Though Paul was apparently accepting of what appeared to be very dire circumstances. Dire, of course, meaning that they're not going to be favorable this time. In the Philippian jail, when he was writing the letters during his first incarceration, oh, I'll be getting out soon. Oh, I'm sure that this will turn out for my deliverance. You just keep praying. I'm confident that I shall return to you. And he says, with the abundance of Jesus Christ, my coming to you again, second time in the Roman jail, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, one of the last rites of uh, the Jewish rites uh, and rituals when the ceremony was almost over. My departure is in ha at hand, and I finish the race, and my reward will be coming soon. Despite these very dire circumstances, and Paul realizes that at least it looks like there's not much hope of his release. You know, you now again, Christians have to realize again, that does not mean that there is not hope. When we think about our existence down here, if we really believe, then our time down here is just a moment as compared to eternity. Everybody gets to live forever, saints. Yes, everyone gets to live forever. You get to live forever. I get to live forever. Saved folks get to live forever. Unsaved folks get to live forever. Forever. It just depends on where you're going to live. Which neighborhood you're going to be in for eternity. Paul is saying, this part of my existence, this speck, this vapor, this momentary status that I am in now is just about over as it appears. However, he continued ministry, and he actually employed his circumstances effectively in his message to convey God's message. Paul's saying, yes, my circumstances, let me tell you about them in light of this gospel. He says, yes, my, my time is almost done. Ministry continues, but my time here is almost over. But what I'm looking forward to is this crown of righteousness of is, is the reward for all the work. Everyone in here may have known, well, I have children here. Maybe they don't know someone personally that has passed away, that they can remember. If you do, you think about those things and you think about those, those people and you begin to, uh, to, to, to yearn for that kind of contact again. If you begin to think about the folks that have gone on, then you understand just a little bit better. We've often said, or I've often said, as my dad used to say, just keep living. Mm -hmm. When you think about the wisdom and knowledge of the folks that you know that have been saved and saved for a while and passed on and gone on to eternity and how true and how, 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 how their life confirms the gospel, the things that you begin to see as you get a little bit older and you keep living, Paul says, I may not be living much longer, but ministry continues. Paul says, I'm looking forward to the crown of righteousness. I'll get one and you'll get one if you believe like me. He's accepting of what appeared to be these circumstances, but began to employ this, his, 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 th this knowledge of how fleeting life was to the ministry of the gospel, just from the introduction, a little bit of the background, we're clued in to the intent of the title here, as now Paul's accommodations are a lot different. Paul's prison that he's in now is quite a bit different. This was, some say, what's called a uh, one of the Merriman 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 M A R E N T I N E prisons in Rome look up the word these prisons and they have pictures of them they're thought to be that old there's two in particular 
two in particular that they look at as examples. Now, you can't be dogmatic, but considering the age of these places, the location of these places, um, and there was a, an upper and a lower. And if you're in the lower one, which was smaller, you would be lowered through a hole. You look up that word and you look up images and of course now they're decorated a bit but you can still see uh how they are hewn in in in, 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 in built it's 20 by 10 one says 27 by about the same uh feet if you if you can picture those things these prisons in this case not a house like Paul was in before. These, these cells were far different than the house where Paul was before. His accommodations, much different this time around. And in these maritime prisons, Paul realized that this likely will not turn out as the first imprisonment did. Turn to 2 Timothy. Fourth chapter, the verses 13. 2 Timothy 4.13. Also get ready to flip just a few pages over to 2 Timothy 2 and 9. This is what he says to Timothy, and he's hoping that Timothy can actually come visit him. How real is the scripture? Second Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, again, with these much more dire circumstances. There was apparently a way where he was allowed some contact. And if that were the case, he's telling Timothy to come visit me, even though these accommodations are much more dire. And he makes a request. Second Timothy 4.13, he says, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. You know, the, one of our acquaintances there, and there's a cloak uh, that you can, can, doesn't that sound like somebody leaving you a text mm -hmm. or something? When you come visit me, go to my room and get my big coat. Mm -hmm. Why do you need a big coat? Because he's cold and likely very wet. He says, when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Go to 2 Timothy 2.9. 2 Timothy 2nd chapter, verse 9. It says, so again, Paul writing to Timothy, saying, you know, my accommodations here are different, and I'm going to be cold if I'm not cold already. Winter was likely coming. And he says, and, again, and he says, bring my big coat. 2 Timothy 2.9. He says, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Point there we want to focus on is he's saying that, yeah, I might be in the stocks or I might be in chains in this case. He may also be noting back to his first imprisonment where he may have likely been chained to the soldier, to the Roman soldier that was watching him. But he's saying here, look at my circumstances in any case. He's saying in these current circumstances, likely cold and wet, or in previous or current circumstances, there's chains. Saints, this isn't a story. This was Paul's existence. This is what he had to suffer for for the gospel. This is what he had to suffer for the gospel. Of course, this isn't the first time that Paul had to endure in ministry despite the most unfavorable of circumstances. Paul, likely cold and wet in the Greek, that word cloak means great coat. Again, can you picture that? You know somebody who's not doing too well and they need something. He's saying, if you can get here, get here and bring me that. Paul's in a prison, uh, 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 Timothy is somewhere else, and he says, I'm cold. That puts you right there in the jail. Mm -hmm. That puts you in the room. I need my big coat in this great coat in the Greek. 
means a garment usually for traveling or for cold and rainy conditions. So who knows what his accommodations were. There was supposedly or could have been some kind of a spigot or so in the floor of this jail. I don't know if that's how he got his water or maybe it just kept the room wet. Maybe there were stocks on the wall that they put him in at any given time. Maybe his conditions, uh, uh, well, we know his conditions were far worse than they were the first time around. Paul's still talking about ministry, though, because he goes on in 2.9 and he says, yeah, I'll suffer this as an evildoer. In other words, I'm not an evildoer, but I'll be punished as one, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Isn't that amazing? Look how he switches up the the tone of it. He says, don't get caught up in my circumstances, though. I need these things so that I can be a good, strong example, so that I can continue to do ministry as much as these circumstances allow. What are your circumstances, saints? Are you continuing on in what God would have you do? Or are you succumbing to all of the circumstances and changing your behavior and your language and your look? And have you given up on the gospel? Or are these circumstances just a wonderful opportunity to show anyone and everyone who desires exactly what the gospel is and what it is to you, being the earthly example, just like Paul. Paul says, bring me my great coat and bring me my books and especially the parchments and there's been much debate over what these books could be. Did Paul travel with these books? It looks like he probably did, but he wasn't allowed, of course, to take them with him during this second incarceration. Nero wasn't too interested in allowing Paul all the freedoms that me, he may have had before, and especially the parchments, writing materials likely, or something that maybe he had already written, maybe letters that he was preparing and was in the and, and had to finish. I don't know what they were. No one exactly knows what they were, but Paul is saying ministry's got to continue. I don't care what the circumstances are. Their circumstances have changed, and for most of us, they likely have. Are you continuing in ministry, or did it change you to the point where I don't worship no more, I don't attend no more, I sure don't have to sit in front of a computer screen anymore and look at it. It's just kind of like, well, great, COVID has allowed me the freedom that I really wanted anyway. Or has it turned you to the gospel? Has it enlivened you? I know, oh my goodness, what a wonderful opportunity it presented for us to push us in that direction because now we're Bible study and, and prayer meeting every Wednesday night. And what a glorious, what a wonderful fellowship it is with the handful of folks that we have there on, on, on screen, on camera. We can see a name or two. We know that other folks are listening in and truly just to pray with the saints for an hour. Bible study following and we're in different locations. Paul saying, bring me my books and my right material. Paul saying, ministry's got to continue. Even though my circumstances have gotten worse. This letter was presented to a pastor. But it applies to all of the elect. This letter, of course, written to Timothy. Paul's understudy, young pastor in Ephesus. But of course, the message applies to all. Paul's understudy, Timothy, he calls him his beloved son. His beloved son and true son. Let's turn to 1 Timothy 1 and 2. So turn to the first letter to Timothy. Go to the first chapter. I'll read the second verse. Well, I'll just read one and two. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of our God and Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Second Timothy, first chapter, 
Same thing, first verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Jesus Christ. Now talking directly to Timothy, of course. To Timothy, a beloved son. Grace, mercy, and peace from the God, excuse me, from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul in both letters, of course, writing to his understudy, his young protege, if you would, Timothy. Paul didn't have any children of his own. Thus, Timothy became his spiritually, or one of his spiritually adopted sons. You'll see some similar language if you turn to Titus and look in the beginning of that book. Similar language to Philemon. And look in the beginning of his letter to him. Paul, the consummate pastor, the consummate preacher, the constant cons consummate father, if you would, spiritually. And these men uh, became even more to Paul than just spiritual protégés. They were, in essence, his adopted children. Paul trained them well. Didn't have any children of his own. Timothy. He began to have a very special affection for, go to the book of Acts, the chapter 16, the verse number 1, Acts 16, chapter 16, and verse 1. It says this, a little more background, Paul, of course, that second Roman imprisonment, and you, you see the reality of his circumstances. He's asking for a coat. Here, talking about Timothy's relationship with him, we can see where the relationship began. These are particulars that really kind of put us there. The preacher's responsibility is to, is to bridge the gap paint the picture without adding or taking away, but allowing the scripture to speak for itself and expounding upon Acts 16 and 1. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. So, that's a particular. So you know now that Timothy was what? Mixed, right? <laughs> he was a Jew and a Greek. He was biracial, if you would. He had some Jewish blood and he had some Gentile blood. Timothy, the understudy. And isn't that beautiful? Because, again, Paul, of course, was called, right, to to, to who? Who was Paul called to preach to? Mm -hmm. The Gentiles. Does that mean he shunned Jews? No. Absolutely not. There was folks all over the place, inside and out of the temple, uh, uh, of, of the circumcision and, and not of the circumcision. And any number of folks became interested and sparked by, and their heart was tugged. And Paul wasn't only loyal to one. He says repeatedly, that, no, you can't lay a charge against me. I preach to everybody the same. Timothy's biracial status, if you would, both Jew and Gentile, is just a beautiful example of what the gospel is, as it's irrespective of person. Because you can get saved. And he can pull you out of whatever circumstance that you are in. doesn't matter where you came from or what you look like. He's going to love you just the same. Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who believed. So she was a converted Jew. And, but his father was Greek. So, verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. He had a great reputation already. Timothy and Timothy's faith or his understanding of or his disposition, he was known for having a good rep. 
So Paul, verse 3, wanted him, wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was what? Greek. Greek. So now we see what? We see a little example here of ministries beginning for you, Timothy. Look how serious it gets. Right away, right? Well, here comes Paul. I know who that guy is. He wants me to go with him. Hey, sure, let's go. I guess I, I got to go. I'm a believer. My mom taught me. My dad I, and his family structure, he was renowned. He was known amongst the brethren. Now it gets serious. Yeah, but you got to you gotta get circumcised, Timothy. Whoa, okay, hold on. How serious it's getting all of a sudden. Though Jewish by his mother's bloodline, Timothy was not circumcised because his father was Greek. Dad's Greek. Dad's not a Jew. Dad wasn't circumcised. Circumcised. Timothy, not circumcised. Now, this was not required of the Gentiles. So what? He's got an option. He doesn't have to get circumcised. It's not required. Paul preached and taught that it's not required, right? Mm -hmm. Paul corrected any number of Jews any number of times that your circumcision is not what gets you the blessings or 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 or, or places you in the ark of safety or 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 suddenly you're you're not a child of God. You're not saved by Christ. Nothing to do with your circumcision. But he has Timothy get circumcised. And they believe that, again, he did it by his own hand. Mm. Though not required, Paul circumcised Timothy to ensure he was accepted amongst the Jews that they were going to be evangelizing. Wait a minute. Paul's called to the Gentiles. But he says here in that third verse, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in the region. And the Jews that were there knew that he was Greek. And they're saying, wait a minute, that guy's daddy is Greek. That means he ain't gonna be circumcised. They're not gonna listen to him. They're not going to give him the kind of attention that they would somebody who was of the circumcision. What an amazing example by Paul. And what incredible submission and sacrifice to the faith by Timothy. Mm -hmm. As soon as this man's missionary journey is beginning in serious uh, form, oh, he has to commit or do a serious act or a serious submission just for the sake of the gospel. This disposition of sacrificing my personal freedoms. This disposition was not just Paul's choice to do so. Okay, that's what Paul chose to do. I don't have to do that. Well, that's what these preachers have to do. I don't have to do that. Well, subtitled, I think I just said it a minute ago. It's The letter was presented to a pastor, but it applies to all, all of the elect. So the messages here or the doctrine that's preached or, or taught in 2 Timothy, there may be some things that may be specific to, to the pastorate, but as far as roles and responsibilities, yes. But when it comes to disposition and doctrine, all the same. It's doctrine of sacrifice and endurance and, and, and suffrage. Oh my goodness, it applies to all. Me sacrificing my personal freedoms, not just Paul's choice. It is perfectly example. Who is our perfect example Christ. of sacrifice? Christ. Christ. We've read it several weeks in a row, probably. I, I think Brother Greg may have read, may, maybe, maybe Brother Trent. I know I've said it the last few weeks because it just fit perfectly. Uh, it went in the doctor, doctrine that's being presented that Christ left heaven to come down to earth not just to come down to earth to take physical form, come down from a higher place to a lower place, 
to take the form of flesh and to submit himself for the judgments of men. You talk about, can, and I think we said, how low can we go? This lowly disposition, this attitude of sacrifice lets us know truly, as the title states, that we are indeed elected to endure. Paul says, of course, he's one of the elect and he has to endure many things. And if we want to just put that on Paul, we are dead wrong. Timothy, yeah, he's a shepherd. He's a pastor. And we can see that his began right away as he was required by Paul, in this case, to be circumcised, even though it was not a requirement, of course, for the faith. Not just Paul's choice to do so, this sacrificial disposition, this uh, election and endurance is perfectly exampled by Christ. It is documented now in the epistles. What did we say? Paul's circumstances, he didn't just say, okay, let me just keep reading out of the book. No, Paul says, look at how my life and our lives will dictate the doctrine here or give you an example, shall we say, of the doctrine here. Timothy, I got to cut you. All for sake of the gospel. Example by Christ, documented in the epistles. Thus it is doctrine and required of all, all of the elects. No, I'm not saying that you got to get yourself circumcised. I'm saying your attitude and disposition of sacrifice and endurance and suffering must be the same. You have to give up of your personal freedoms for sake of the gospel. 1 Corinthians, turn to the book. In the chapter, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll begin at verse 19. Again, keep that theme in your mind. Wow, so we got pastor to pastor here. We've got Paul to Timothy talking, and we have a little bit of background. We know that Timothy is both Jew and Gentile, his daddy being Greek. He's not circumcised, but he immediately had to be before his ministry with Paul began. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, in this example, example by Paul, Paul's example and our example is Christ, and then Timothy. What does Paul say to the Corinthians in 9, 19? For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. We could stop right there. Paul is saying, my personal freedoms are not the issue. Christians, Christians are required to give it up for sake of the gospel. Paul says, made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And he means Jew and Gentile. Uh, uh, verse 20, and to the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win Jews for those who are under the law as under the law. Paul says, if I got to live under the law so that I can get your attention for a little, well, I'll do that because I need to show you how the gospel and the, how the gospel relieves you from all of the restrictions of the law. There's freedom in it. But if I have to submit myself and live under it and live like one, I'll do that as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, and those who are without the law, pagans, Gentiles, I'll live without the law, as without the law, uh, not being without the law of God, but law toward, uh, but excuse me, not being without the law of God, but under law toward Christ. He's saying, I'm not living lawlessly, but I'm just not, under the law as instituted by the Jews, under the Jews, that I might win those who are without the law. So immediately again, we see that example of Timothy being both Gentile or, or, and, and Jew. And Paul saying, what a perfect example. I'm going to take this man who's considered to be Greek because that's his daddy's bloodline. He's got Jewish blood. But he doesn't have to be circumcised, but we're going to circumcise him because I've called to the Gentiles, but it's going to be some Jews that we got to keep their attention. 
We've got to make sure that we can they can see how much of a sacrifice just so someone might be saved. Isn't that amazing? Verse 22, to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. He's saying if somebody can get saved, then it's worth me sacrificing. Your sacrifice is worth some be partaker of it with you. He's saying you're required to do the same because when you got saved, you likely saw an example yourself of that kind of sacrifice. You're a partaker. I'm a partaker. We're all partakers taking part in this kind of sacrifice to save those who need to be saved. How many times have we asked saints? Just because it was one of the most poignant questions that had ever been posed as as myself and the group that I learned theology with, that question that was asked, we're talking about here personal freedoms. And Paul saying, wait a minute, I'm going to give up. He said, I'm a free man, but I'll, I'll give up my freedoms. Question was, does the Christian have a choice? You're elected to endure. You got a choice. You're called to see or save the sacrifice. You got a choice. Does the Christian have a choice? Sounds to me when I hear this little background on Brother Timothy, Timothy realized, I don't have a choice. Go to 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 13 through 17. Excuse me. Yeah, I did say 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verse 13. Just one example again. Just a beautiful example again and again and again how Paul... Uh, and, and Timothy's relationship, how he states doctrine in 1 Corinthians 9, how, how it's required that you are not to be uh, biased or, or, or treating different men differently. He's saying, Jew or Gentile, it don't matter. He's stating there how valuable it is, each one of those souls, and it has nothing to do with the blood that they were born with. Just one example of how, again, we are indeed elected to endure, as the title says, and we must do so willingly, saints. First Peter, second chapter, verse 13. Listen to this. Think about your current circumstances. Think about the news reports that you've seen, the masks and social distances and the pro distancing and the protests. And, and all these folks fighting back and forth because they don't want to do and I shouldn't have to do. And listen to these words, First Peter. And again, we just were in First Peter with humbled and exalted for several weeks, right? And these folks were the victims Peter was writing to. These were not the folks who wielded the power. These were the folks who were on the run. And he's telling them, then Jew, mostly, Save Jews, but of course, if they were Greeks, it would apply to them as well. Again, this letter is presented to a pastor, but we have any number of other uh, uh, other statements. We go to Book of Acts, we've read Corinthians, and he's, he, 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 he writes it out for us right there. I don't care if they're Jew or Greek, your requirement is to sacrifice. First Peter 2.13, submit yourself to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. What? They're already chasing me and beat me and ran me from my homeland. He's saying, yeah, but more important than that is they get saved. Submit yourself to for the Lord's sake. Now, again, it says for the Lord's sake. Now, the Lord doesn't need you to save him. He's talking about for, of course, sake of the gospel for the message of the gospel, for the message of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can reach their heart. And if you can be an example of that kind of sacrifice, that's the important thing. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. What do you have to give up, free man? Give it up. Whether to a king or uh, as, oh, as, as the one in authority 
or the governors. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff in our news every wow. single day about our governor, and it's tantamount to the same. There may be a slight difference in the actual office that it's referring to, but when it comes to the ruler of a certain municipality, absolutely, right? California is huge. And everybody's mad at the governor for some things, right? Now, again, some of the stuff they need to hold him accountable for. But let's keep reading. Whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. He's saying whether he's just in doing it or not, he's telling them, again, he may he may put you under some kind of restrictions and these restrictions are the kind that would be that would subject those who are evil to have to live under those kinds of things verse 15 again because again in 14 he says as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers he may send an order or a dictate down the line. It's kind of like, wait a minute, I, I, I didn't do any of that stuff. And he says, you need to submit to that, though. Why? For sake of the gospel? Wait, 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 wait. I got to act like I'm guilty of something because because what? Yeah, because somebody might see it and get saved. Somebody might see that kind of sacrifice. Somebody might see that you love them so much. We talked about how there were Christian folk, first century in antiquity, that gave themselves to indenture as slaves for the Lord's sake, for the sake of the gospel. Verse 15, for such is the will of God. What? Now, now, how do we mistake that or change that or twist that a little bit? Because again, okay, because some people like, they love to do this, right? They say, oh, that was just Paul talking, right? Well, no, Paul just said that. And again, we can change that or adjust that because we don't like that. Paul says, for such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. All these folks that are spouting off all those folks that may be in the media that are to accuse you of things. How can they accuse you when you willingly and lovingly submit? Verse 16, act as free men. Okay. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. But use it as slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the king. He's saying this should be your general disposition as you live amongst these circumstances. There's going to be some dictates come down from, from the capital, from the governor, from the king, and you ain't going to like them. He's going to say submit to them. Submit to them for the sake of the gospel to every human institution. This text speaks directly to our current circumstances and all the mandates, federal, state, local, regarding COVID. What do we have to wear? A mask, mm -hmm. right? We've been social distancing for quite some time. We are not allowed to gather and so many other things that go along with. And there's a clear correlation between the wearing of a mask and so many of these other uh, restrictions and and rules that we're living under right now to slow or stop the spread of the virus, especially to protect those who are high risk, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I may not be high risk. I'm strong as an ox. I'm feeling great. I'm not in the high risk category, so I have my rights. I don't have to. The Bible says, well, it's not about you and your rights. Yeah. I mean, it says so very specifically here with respect to the masks and the restrictions. You don't have to believe the numbers, but you can turn on the TV, go online, or just go down to a hospital. COVID is real. Mm -hmm. I've known several that have died in the parole office, literally, every week. One on my caseload. I was called out on a Saturday. He had not moved. He was clearly suffering from, and in his vehicle, homeless. We called the emergency services. He was immediately incubated and he did not survive. And just two weeks later, 
so many other examples of people who have lost their lives. And I got to wear a mask. There was actually, again, on a Christian radio station. On a Christian radio station, my wife and I were just listening, running some errands. And these folks are shouting for their rights. Mm -hmm. And he says, and they're putting it on the governor. And they're saying, well, the governor is making us wear these masks and whatnot. And I got to wear a mask. Uh, he's, he's requiring uh, the re placing all these restrictions on everyone just to save the lives of a few. Yeah. He actually said the words. Mm -hmm. This text speaks directly to it, saints. And if we believe the Bible is real, then it's still real today. There's a clear correlation between the wearing of masks and all the social distancing. The numbers are going down now because of hopefully because of the vaccine and uh, and the numbers had been skyrocketing even after the vaccines had been developed and the first rollout, but they've had some problems with that and all of the numbers and the minutia and the, the logistics of getting it out there, that has nothing to do with the Christian and the requirement to endure all of the restrictions and the requirement to endure the giving up of personal sacrifices for the, belt, for the welfare and benefit of the many. Mm -hmm. Paul here, when he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, what he's talking about everybody who ain't saved. It's like it's a whole bunch of folks, and if they can see an example of sacrificial love, then they might come. Because he says to save some. <clears throat> the Christian does indeed Asking the question again, does the Christian have a choice? Does the Christian have a choice? The Christian does indeed have what's called volition. What's volition? V-O-L-I-T-I-O-N. It's the faculty or the power or the ability. You might even say the right to choose. Oh, the Christian has volition, but the Christian does not have a choice. Paul's saying, you don't have a choice. Paul told Timothy, I got to cut you, my man, because it's more important that they see that kind of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Saints, we are saved to suffer and elected to endure all hardships. That verse actually says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. In other words, if you got a lawful order, do it for sake of the gospel. Now, I'm not talking about folks who are not Christians because they're likely not going to do so if they're feeling themselves to be uh, overly restricted and they don't have that kind of love for their fellow man. The Christian does have volition, but does not have a choice. We're saved to suffer. We are bond servants. It says that we are slaves of God. Turn on the TV, the radio, social media sources, Christians claiming Christ, but refusing to wear a mask. They're shouting, it's not the law, I don't have to wear a mask. I got rights. All of these me statements. I don't have to, my rights, my rights, my rights, my rights. I'm not sacrificing my rights for anyone. Yeah, even though I, I, I know that even many of them even acknowledge that yes, there might be some ramifications but I'd rather deal with the ramifications than, de than, than give up my rights. Right. If it kills me, then I die, but my rights are more important. The verse actually speaks to our reference verse here, your personal freedoms, and not to use them as a covering for evil. We saw in the last installment, installment of Humbled and Exalted, the last brief series just a couple of weeks ago, where we chronicled Satan's what statements, his I statements. You remember those? Yep. I believe it was 12th chapter of Isaiah. How Satan's arrogance and pride and selfishness. Satan's saying, no, I'm going to be up there. It's me. It's about me. The selfishness, selfishness is, is exemplified in those I statements. I will rise to the mount of the assembly. I will put my throne a top, uh, uh, I mean, he just said it repeatedly. He was discharged from heaven as a result. Thus, think about it, saints. These I statements, they are, say, they're inherently evil. Mm -hmm. 
Biblically, love is what? Selflessness. It's one way you could characterize it. Evil, selfishness. Evil is saying me, 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 me. Evil is saying I am the one of import. Evil is saying that uh, uh, my rights are most important. These things came directly from the heart of Satan, trying to put himself in a place where he did not belong, trying to reserve for himself. A reference says, text says, submit yourself for the sake of the gospel to every human institution from kings or governors. Now that's not to say, listen, saints, that is not to say that those who occupy state office or any office are not subject to review because they are. Yeah. Or even recall. There's a serious push for recall. I'm not saying he shouldn't be recalled. I, if he doesn't meet a standard that the voters legally and lawfully voted him in for and they are allowed that recourse, then that's fine. He hasn't performed up to a standard. That's not to say that we should not fight for the right to gather, especially in churches. If churches are being singled out and excluded from gathering when other places and organizations are allowed, but all the same to give up some of the freedoms that allow. You have to have a place large enough. You have to uh, uh, make sure that you are socially distanced, wear the mask, sanitize before, after, etc. All the rules and regulations, those are the things that are, are, are necessary if we're going to uh, be allowed to. And again, you may have to fight for those things. But the Holy Spirit that resides in you, that resides in me, that abides in all of us as Christians gives us the wisdom to discern the difference. When it comes to me wearing a mask because I may be a carrier, because my body is strong enough to withstand and uh, maybe even expel the virus, but I may pass it on to someone else as a Christian, that means I have to sacrifice. That means I have to forsake of the gospel. And this, these verses and this doctrine is not difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. This Holy Spirit gives us the wisdom to discern the difference and the power indeed to endure. Thank you, saints. We'll pick it up next time. We'll pick it up next occasion for installment number two of elected to endure. I thank you, thank you for joining us again. I ask that you join us again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for Bible study and for, excuse me, for prayer at seven for Bible study at eight. For the Trent, we'll be closing out uh, a wonderful series talking about grace and grace alone that saves. The good Lord continues to put it on your heart Please go to AnsomBibleChurch.org, click the gold donate button. God bless you, saints.